A very warm welcome to all of you here this morning, and may the Lord's presence and the moving of the Holy Spirit as we listen to the words that God has inspired and preserved for us in His Word. Uh, we welcome you very happily to Gethsemane and would like to encourage you to find uh, someone uh, in, uh, who have been in this church for some time. Talk with them, please, and let us know your names and contact. we will be more than happy in any way to reach out to you if you have any questions, if you need any spiritual help, anything at all that we can do for you. We are happy to render ourselves to help you. So please, um, when someone would approach you, please uh, avail uh, whatever uh, they will require of you, maybe your names or your address or contact information. And we'll be very happy to bring you into the fellowship as quickly as possible so you can benefit from being part of this church. A very warm welcome to all. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel chapter 12 and verses 14 to 21 for today's study of God's Word. Matthew 12, 14 to 21. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. God's beloved servant and his mission on earth that is the subject of Matthew's presentation of this passage. He presents Christ to us as God's beloved servant, even though people started to reject him. And so, today we have an opportunity to see Christ in a very unique setting, where he is truly God's chosen servant, and yet people rejecting him with utter contempt for him. When God loves him for what he is on earth, the people, the religious people, grow in absolute intolerance of Christ. On one man, on one side, man rages in anger. On the other side, God stoops down and smiles at his son and calls him, my beloved. Dear friends, this setting is nothing unusual in a way because it is true even here, this day. Whether you would look at Christ with contempt and rejection or not, let me tell you, God has only one feeling toward His Son who took the form of a servant to serve us as our Savior. And that is one of total, complete, perfect love. And you see that in verse 18, when Matthew quotes Isaiah, which we read this morning from Isaiah chapter 42, responsively, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, Behold my servant. 
whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. Beloved servant of God, Jesus Christ, how do we see him? Let's first of all notice in verse 14, Christ is presented to us as God's beloved servant hated by his false servants. Beloved servant hated by false servants. Verse 14, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. You see, you see right away, Matthew telling us that there was great hostility, hatred in the hearts of the leaders of the Jews. Particularly, here we are, men we are told the Pharisees. They had a conversation about the Sabbath day and the keeping of the Sabbath. You remember last Sunday we noticed, and Jesus gave them very clear exposition of what it means to observe the Sabbath. He said, I'm the Lord of Sabbath. Son of man is the Lord of Sabbath. And it must be always remembered that you can't serve the Sabbath day without serving the Lord of the Sabbath. You can't fulfill the laws of God without pleasing the Lord of the Sabbath. And it means that you do the will of God. Not that you become so legalistic. God doesn't take any pleasure in your legalism. Just because you, you dressed in a certain way, just because you did eat or didn't eat, or just because you walk or not walk is not the issue. If God has said some of these things like how much work you do or how much work you shouldn't do, it is not to distract you from Him. It's not to fix you to those stipulations, but that those stipulations may lift you and help you to focus on Him and on Him alone on the day of worship. If God says you have to be merciful to those who are in need on the Sabbath day, you have to. You have to help them. If they are hungry, you must feed them. You don't send them away in hunger. So Jesus guide them through the cornfield and let them have some Food for their hunger on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees didn't like it. Jesus told them that it is right to do the religious service such as killing of animals. On Sabbath day, if you kill or butcher an animal for, for mutton soup or something like that, it will be a sin because the Sunday is not for you to work in that regard. <clears throat> not to have sales of meat and so on. It's a day that you must come to worship God. So in the process, in the Old Testament, there were religious sacrifices of killing animals as a sacrifice for sin. And that was not sinful. Priests did all those works. So Jesus said, there are works you can do which are required of the religious duties. That's not sin. Though it may be a profane thing to do outside the religious service. And also... He talked about the importance of showing mercy to those who are in need, those who are sick. You would help an animal that falls into a ditch. You would bring it up from the pit. Why wouldn't you help someone who is really in need? So there are works of necessity, works of service to God and works of mercy, which are all allowed on the Sabbath day. And by saying these things, Jesus actually caused the Pharisees to shut up because their laws were not fulfilling God's mercy and righteousness, but preventing people from doing what is God's will. And because they were trounced by the wisdom of God, because they were silenced by the power and the authority of Christ's teaching. They went out, that's what we read in verse 14, very angrily and held a council. There was a secret meeting. 
Why? That they may know how they can destroy Christ. A murderous plot was on the way. You see, dear friends, it didn't happen all of a sudden. If you have been uh, carefully following the messages that I preach from the Gospel of Matthew, you would see that from chapter 11, you see that the hatred was beginning. The first 15 verses of chapter 11, if you carefully analyze, would see that the people were, especially the Jews, were growing in doubt of Christ. They were not all believing. They had questions about him. They questioned his, his messiahship. Then in verses 16 to 19 of chapter 11, that's a preceding uh, chapter, the doubt turns into criticism. They dare to openly criticize him. And in the last section of chapter 11, verses 20 to 24, we notice the criticism became indifference or rejection. They turned away from him. They were unconcerned about his words and deeds. Their apathy towards Christ was very obvious by the end of chapter 11. So from doubt to criticism and from criticism to total indifference to Christ. You know, when people's nonchalance about Christ was expressed, it couldn't stop there anymore. They tried to distance themselves from Christ. And that would mean that they have to now openly show their dislike for him. And that becomes hatred. And that becomes murderers. So when we come to chapter 12, wherein we are now, the indifference becomes rejection and hatred and murder. Almost murder, rather. Because God has not allowed their hatred to be carried out. And, you know, they, they would accuse him for the worst things that their religion would allow to put a man to sin, and, I mean, put to death. And that would be blasphemy. They would accuse him of blasphemy. In other words, they would say Jesus is not really God as he claims to be. And therefore, they want to kill him. So blasphemy will be the utter cry of this People who hate Christ. They say blasphemy. Kill him. He says that he is son of God. And that's how this hatred is going to culminate. But I want to give you a little bit more uh, view of this hatred. It's going on. Okay. God's beloved servant. Uh, being hated by false servants. Such as the Pharisees. They wanted to destroy him. That's what we read. They wanted to destroy him. And so they met together to plot how to catch him and destroy him. So it's no more a hater in the heart. It is about to explode into murder. Would you like to see how Luke wrote about this? If you go to the parallel passage in, uh, of this event in Luke chapter 6 verse 11. Luke 6 11. Luke reports this in this way. And they were filled with madness. Wow. They were filled with what? Madness. You know, hatred can make you rather mad. You don't know what you are talking and thinking. You become mad. You become rather upset and listless in your mind. You're so fed up. And you will behave like a mad person, boiled up. Your face will express your madness. You look unreasonable. You look so incensed. And you will say anything that comes to your mind. And that gathering of people, quietly, was really a mad place. You know, it would be much worse than I am match. Mentally uh, sick people are warded in I am match. You know why it will be better? Because their people are given medicine and they are calmer. Though they are mentally unsound. But here they are in full display of their agitation. 
total dislike. So Luke says they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. <laughs> Cannot get it. They want to give the worst to Christ. They might have considered such charges, false charges against Christ as blasphemy, which is punishable by death, and which will be the ultimate charge they will bring against him when they crucify him. They are waiting. They are talking. To come up with a quick resolution, to pounce on him, a way to get him. They want to have an opportunity to destroy him. They want to do it quick. They want to be very, very effective. You know, in modern terms, we may say they want a precision strike to take him out. Like the Americans tried to find a way to take Osama bin Laden. Here is the high-powered people who knows how to do it, who has the power to do it. If you go to Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, you will have another description that the Bible gives about the hatred of this people against God's beloved servant. Read this. Mark, chapter 3, verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straight away took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Now look. Who are in the team? Not only the Pharisees, not only the Jews, religious people, but also the Herodians. They welcomed their arch enemies. You see, Herodians and the Jews don't get along very well. Because Herodians are secular people, irreligious secular people, who actually live to support the royal dynasty of Herod. They are very loyal to Herod. Herod is not a real Jew. In a way, he is a pagan. And they would support Herod to keep his rule over the Jews. And the Jews hated them. But because now they have a mutual enemy who would criticize both the Jews and the Herodians because of their sins, they came together. You know what? Even enemies get together to kill Christ. When you are a Christian, people who war against one another will come again against you because of Christ. You'll be surprised. You won't understand why they get together. The reason is that pure hatred. And so Mark says, the Pharisees went forth and straight away took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy so though the Jews were antagonist, antagonistic toward the Herodians, they were willing to make a league with them to get rid of Christ, the mutual enemy. They both wanted Jesus dead. They wanted to destroy him. They wanted to kill him. <laughs> what a friendship. Here is a group of people, the Pharisees, legalists. And there is a group of Herodians who are antinomians, who have no regard for the law of God. So there are legalists and antinomians together. There is this group of religionists and secularists. What a combination. What an alliance. Funny, isn't it? Because they have a mutual enemy who is loved by God. Hatred for Christ has become the common cause. Now the motto appears to be preserve our religion, preserve our throne, the throne of our King Herod, but get rid of Christ the Messiah. That's the motto. I hope we will not be that kind of people in our church. You know, we can be so religious that we may forget our Savior. We can be so thoughtful about this and that that we believe. Our, our commitment to politics, 
politics, our commitment to economics, our commitment to science, our commitment to this and that, and you disregard Christ. And that's what happens in the church today. You have what is known as theistic evolution, because there's a bunch of people who are so committed to science at the expense of God's truth. So they try to somehow mix the billion years of evolution of some unbelieving atheistic people with that of the Genesis account that God created all things in seven days. So you ended up with very spiritual, <laughs> counterfeit, theistic evolution. And many such things going on in our church. What we see in churches today is a merger of religion and secularism. A merger of what appears to be religion and a pure display of worldliness. And they know how to make it all look spiritual. But let me tell you, Jesus will be utterly discontent with it. He will rebuke it in the sharpest ways. May God rebuke us that no such syncretism will be found in our hearts or in our midst. We must remember pure religion is that which Jesus promotes. Any form of syncretism, any form of compromise is not for Christ. He is the pure light. There's no darkness in him. So here, the Jews and the Herodians counsel together. Both were unwilling to accept the king from heaven. They would rather serve the king on earth at the expense of the king from heaven. They would kill Jesus Christ and they will put up a plaque on the top of the cross, the king of the Jews. They mock him. They will put a crown of thorns on his head to mock him. They will do everything to mock the great truth about Christ that he is God's king on earth. He came to save his people. He didn't come first to reign supreme. He will come again for that. But he came to redeem his people who were lost. That he may redeem them for his own kingdom. And he came like a servant. Like a loving king who is willing to leave his throne. To go down where his people are suffering and dying to save them. He came that way but they mock him. They said he's not our king. And they are determined to kill him. But of course... That would not change God's plan. God is immutable, unchanging. He is unfailing. Though both groups combine together to destroy Christ, they can't destroy until God's timing comes. But we remember this. God's beloved servant, Jesus Christ, was hated by the world. So we who serve Christ sincerely will also be hated. We better be prepared. We can't be sitting at one corner and cry about this. Remember what John said in John chapter 1 verse 11. He came unto his own and his own received him not. You remember that? And that's what we are seeing here. The full display of John 1 11. Please understand this is the beginning of hostility and it will have an apex when Christ will be killed. This is just one year into the ministry. Two years before his death. Two years before his murder on the cross. He only preached about one year. Already it became so evident that the people are unhappy with him. Quite early in his public ministry. And this hostility is going to escalate. In two years time it will be unbearable and it will just explode into quick capture of Christ. Jesus knew it all the time. Let's remember in the face of this hatred for Christ that their attempt to destroy Christ only sealed their eternal destruction. And at the same time, 
the salvation of God's elect. All the gathering together, all the mocking of Christ, all the disregard for Christ, were actually sealing their own peril in hell. The hatred which would be displayed by killing him would actually become the means of the salvation of God's people. So let's rejoice. No amount of hatred that man would pour upon Christ would mean that he doesn't belong to God. He's still God's beloved. Dear friends, we never decide whether we should follow Christ based on popular vote for Christ. If Christ were to stand for election, which he wouldn't, he would surely be voted out. You know, I hear all the sadness of Americans. <laughs> Such a sad thing. I, I feel very sorry for American Christians. Who to choose? It's so sad. It's a country that supported Christian missions everywhere. Is now utterly anti-Christian. All for anything secular, carnal and wicked. It is the seat of sinfulness today. And the so-called Republicans who were more kind toward Christians, evangelicals and all that, also have to make a choice of a man who is constantly attacked for his immor immoral behavior. Whether it's true or not, God knows. But the way he is, the way he speaks, very hard to believe what he says. It's so sad. Now, dear friends, we have to face this sort of situation in this world again and again because this is not a world that appreciates our Savior. It is a world that is accustomed to call that which God has said is my beloved as abominable. They call Jesus all sorts of names, isn't it? They even call him a devil when they said he is Beelzebub. And so, please, remember, if you follow Jesus, you must have a deaf ear to what the people say about Christ. Your heart must be convicted of who he is. Because the world is going to hate him continually. Hatred for Christ has never entered. It's actually on the rise again. And even within churches. There are pastors, ministers of the church who hate Jesus and all his truth. They constantly try to twist and turn and, 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 and change what Jesus said. In such a time as this, may we say to Father in heaven, O oh God, our Father in heaven, teach us to believe what you have said about your Son and not what people say about thy Son. The second thing we notice in the following two verses, verses 15 and 16, is beloved servant's commitment to God's plan. Jesus' commitment as God's beloved servant to the plan of God. Verses 15 and 16. But when Jesus knew it, knew what? That they went out to plot to destroy him. He withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known. Some people have asked me this question on several occasions. Why did Jesus tell the multitude not to talk about him? Why did he charge them that they should not make him known? It's a common question I get in church camps or retreats and personal conversations. People always thought, you know, God, Jesus wanted us to testify of him. Like the Samaritan woman who went to her own village and told everybody about Messiah. An entire group came out and heard him and many believed. So why would Jesus then say no to such a thing? Well, very obvious, isn't it, in the context. Jesus was aware of all that was going on. That's how the verse began, verse 15. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew the secret meeting of his enemies. 
Not that somebody came to report. Not that he read in, in, in Straits Times or New York Times. Not because he turned on CNN or Fox News. No. He is an omniscient God. He knows all things what's going on in this world. Nothing is hidden from him. Jesus was aware of all that was going on because he is the omniscient God. And that proves him to be God, isn't it? He knows that which is done in secret. You know, you may be sitting there and smiling in your heart, not your face, but in your heart. Even that God knows. I mean, smiling with a smirk in your heart. Big deal. He knows. He knows who are his enemies. You can never hide. There is no room that will keep the door shut against Christ's knowledge. There is no darkness that prevents Christ from noticing you. There is no distance that he cannot overcome to see you. Everywhere is in him. You know, omnipresence is normally explained as God is everywhere. But let me give you another meaning of it or another way of explaining it. Everywhere is in him. There is no corner and there is no time that is not absent. He's eternal. Everything is in him. He's eternal. Only God can be explained as eternal. And that would mean what? Everything, whether time or space, all are in him. Nothing is absent from him. So he is omnipresent in the sense that he supremely reigns over all things and all things are in him, consist in him. Nothing escapes him. He doesn't have to travel the distance to get there because no distance is away from him. All are in him. He doesn't have to wait to know what will happen 10 years from now or 1,000 years from now because there is no time apart from him. All time is within his eternal existence. And nothing escapes him. You need to understand this. Jesus knew it. You know, when we come to worship, we must fear. We must tremble because we come before a God who knows everything about us. There is no space for hostility when you come for worship. There's no space and time for defiance and, and absent-mindedness and negligence in the presence of worship. It's a total absorption in the greatness of God. And stay there. And whatever he says, we accept. Say, let thy will be done, O God. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. If you don't have that submission to him, no matter where you go and hide, you can hide from me, you know, by hiding behind somebody else. Now, there are people like that. I know. The church, some people don't like my preaching, and so, but they come for whatever reason. And when the moment I go up, they will go to sleep. And some others will take a book and pretend to read, cover the face. Some would just walk out. There are all kinds of things happening. But let me tell you, Christ is after you. You have no escape him. You may escape me. We need to fear God, you know. We don't think that, you know, our, our, our feelings and our responses are not known to him. You can hide it from anyone, but not from God. Not from God. I want you to take a little bit of time with me on this point. Jesus knows all things, and that's why he is going to say, I'm not going to commit myself to any man, but I'm going to remain committed to God's plan. Remember, that's my point when I read this verse. I told you, the beloved servant is committed to God's plan. The reason why God doesn't commit to any man's desire and whim is because he knows man is not obedient to God all the time. If we preachers and we leaders of the church can remember this one thing, it will do very well in our service to God, that we should not be bothered by people's opinion and their desire and their comments. We should just be committed to God. Because people will never follow the Lord's will. They are like a sheep that have gone astray. And those who are appointed as leaders to follow Christ must stand firm to say to people, no, 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 I don't serve you, I God, serve God first. And that has to be clear. Jesus knew the heart of the people. We don't know, but Jesus knew. And that's why it's all the more important for us to be 
very committed to the truth of God's word. When you study the gospel of John, it's very interesting. John paid much attention to tell us that Jesus never committed to people in his service, but committed to God. And one of the ways in which John, in his gospel, explains the reason why Jesus never committed himself to do people's ideas and uh, suggestions and feelings is that he knew what was in the heart of people. If you can just listen to this or you turn to your Bibles. John 2.25 where John says concerning Christ that he needed not that any should testify of man for he knew that what was in man. He didn't need anyone to tell him how a person was thinking or what is in his heart. He didn't need anyone to gossip or report or anything. He knew it. If you go to chapter 6 of John, where you see the hatred of the people piking, really growing up, peaking, and Jesus says this, that this offend you, and do you know to whom he said it? To certain disciples who murmured against him. So Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, and he said unto them, Doth this offend you? He knows what's going on in our hearts, even the murmuring. And he says, Do you, Does it offend you? Now, if you go to chapter 13, verse 11, he talks about Judas Iscariot, who had already plotted to betray Christ, and no disciple knew about it. So when he came into the upper room, when Judas was there, it was recorded this way, John, John 13, 11, For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. He knew who will betray him. I don't think Judas consulted Jesus first before he went out to betray Christ. He didn't say, Master, do you mind I make a bit of money, like let's say 30 pieces of silver, can I sell you? No. He did it in secret. But Jesus says, I know you. You are not all clean. My dear friends, even among the twelve, there was a betrayer, a hater. Jesus knew that. Doesn't he know about you and I? What kind of persons we are? However, Jesus is not going to give in to them in the midst of the escalating ha hatred, Jesus acted to protect himself. And that's why he said that he has to move away. That's why Matthew says to us that Jesus knew it and he withdrew himself from thence. And great multitudes follow him and he healed them all. You know, he was not withdrawing himself from ministry, but he was min withdrawing himself from that moment of murder that was already secured or in a way planned, ready to be executed by these murderous enemies of Christ. Why is it so? Well, the time was not yet. Two more years to go. Two more years to go. And Jesus wouldn't give it to the people. And so also in verse 16, the Bible says, Jesus charged them that they should not make him known. Jesus forewarned them, don't say where I am. and Don't say what I'm doing. There's no need. I will do what I'm supposed to do. Because the more important thing is that I stay with God's plan. God's timing. You know, we are all very impatient people. When we are in the ministry, we want things to happen quickly, right? How come the CLG is not registered? How come the money is not here? I also ask the question then. So why is it taking so long? Why can't it be quick? Who wants to be delayed? Blessed be his name. He does all things according to his time. And we who follow Jesus must learn to have a commitment to God's timing. To his plan. You know, now onwards, from this portion, 
of the scripture onwards, whether it's in Matthew or all other gospels. You're going to see there's a pattern evolving. And it's very interesting. And the pattern is Jesus goes to a place, he preaches and people get excited and suddenly opposition rises and he quietly disappears. And then he appears somewhere else and he starts preaching and doing miracles. People all will gather and they get blessed, but some enemy, enemies will come and they stir up the people and they become very murderous. Jesus will dip, disappear again. And this cycle goes on and on. Appearance, hatred, withdrawal. Appearance, ministry, hatred, disappearance. Until he was finally taken. When Jesus gave himself. He gave up. He went to Garden of Gethsemane, prayed and waited for the enemy to come. So he can give his life as a ransom. Why is it so? Because God the Father had a specific plan for him. Not only that he should die, but when to die was also decreed. And it is revealed in the Old Testament. Let me just give you a quick example. In Daniel chapter 9, we have the 70 weeks appointed by God. And it was said that after 69 weeks, by, by the way, one week is uh, like seven years. Week is seven, right? And so 70, uh, 70 weeks were appointed. That's 490 years. But after the 79 weeks, that's 79 times seven, it was said that the Messiah will cut off. The timing was already mentioned. From the going forth of the commandment for the Jews to return from Babylon to rebuild. And that decree was given by Cyrus. Until the time the Messiah will be cut off. It will be 79 weeks. It was already predicted by God and the timing had to be precise. Otherwise God will be delayed or God will be outrun, outmaneuvered by people. It cannot be. Jesus was very mindful that he must do the Lord's will according to the time that God has appointed. So that every prophecy concerning Jesus may be fulfilled. His birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, all has to be fulfilled. And for them to be fulfilled exactly as God planned, there must be a divine timetable that Christ also must follow. There is a divine timetable for Christ and for us too. My life is in God's hand. I didn't choose my day of birth. God chose the day of my birth. My father didn't, my mother didn't. No man on earth ever decided what day you would be born. And no, listen to this. The Bible also says it is appointed unto man once to die. Who decided your day of death? God did. And so in between everything that happens, we better acknowledge God and say, Lord, I don't want to do anything according to my plan. You may be planning to get married, young people. You better pray, Lord, in your time. Don't run ahead. And neither be too slow. <laughs> Some will say, I wait until 30. Now, who told you that? Some say, oh, I wait until buy a condominium. And then you commit sin in between. Fornication. Because you can't wait. Because you want to follow the agenda of the world. To drive a big car and live in a big house before you get married. Where in the Bible you are told all those things? The Bible says, go get married. Lest you may burn in your lust. Listen. There is a plan by God. Be committed to those things. Not the fashion of the world. Jesus is our supreme example in these matters. There's a divine timetable and we must keep it as our Savior did. We must be aware of this. Our life is not in our hand. We can pick and choose our time. There cannot be a revolution at this point of time in Jesus' ministry where people come and, you know, start fighting. There cannot be the Jews and the Herodians coming together and killing Christ. Because God has said there's a way, to, way for Christ to die. It has to be on the tree. It has to be on the cross. 
Now they cannot come with sword and spear and whack him and finish him off. They can't pick up the stones and kill Jesus. If that's what's going, uh, uh, going to be executed, then the f- predictions concerning Christ would fail. Everything has to be precise, as God said. So Jesus charged them that they should not make him known. Cannot play into their foolish thinking. So Jesus wanted the situation to cool down. He was very aware that there's a need that he should not become prominent and open so a sudden revolt may occur. Uh, This he did not because of fear to die. This he didn't do because he wanted to feel good and safe. No, because of his commitment to Father's will. Do you know that one of the things that Jesus often said, especially you see that in Gospel of John, is that he would say, my hour is not yet come. This he said with regard to his death on the cross. My hour is not yet come. Here are a couple of examples. You just listen. John 7, 6. Jesus said, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. In John 7, 30, he says, they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. 8.20 of John, 8.20. These words spake Jesus in treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid his, their hand, sorry, no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. His hour was not yet come. And several other times as well. So why repeatedly these things are mentioned, that Jesus often say that my hour is not come, and the disciples will respond when they record Jesus, the events in Jesus' life, these things happen or these things didn't happen because his time has not yet come. Because there was a divine timetable, and he was committed to it. How committed are you to divine timetable? How committed is our church to divine timetable? You know, you don't have to worry about the time. God is a God of providence. He moves things which we do not know so that all things may have perfect, coin, perfect merging as far as time is concerned. The appointments of God cannot, cannot ever fail. It will happen at the right time. But for us, we have a part in it. It is not to just sit back and say, let God do things as he wants. No. He wants us to be part of his plan. He wants us to be actively participant. And that's going to be a beautiful thing. You know, one, some of the things that happen in my life and the life of our church is always so exciting. It, whenever I re- retrospectively think about these things, I say, Lord, how did it all work? How perfectly things happened. Now, as a man, I can say I'm surprised that I am in Singapore. I'm surprised that I marry a woman here and she has, she has me as her husband and I have her as my wife. I rejoice in that. And that was amazing. And the fact that I am in Gethsemane is something I never planned. I never even know there's a church called Gethsemane. Even though I was in Singapore for three years. I didn't know where they exist. I didn't know anybody in that church. Well... <laughs> How amazing. How amazing. And just yesterday I was think I think I was preaching in Malayalam Fellowship gathering last night. And I told them, you know, it's really amazing. I've been here for almost 30 years. I was in India for 21 years. So I lived in Singapore more than India. I applied for citizenship. I didn't get it at when I applied, they said you will get answer from us within 12 months. And now it's over 12 months. So my wife was upset. She went there and asked. I was also upset. Of course, she carried my, my frustration. She went there and asked them, how come no reply? The lady looked at the computer and said, oh, pending. So she came home, told me, pending. I said, OK, good, pending. Why? It's not God's time. If they reject, God's time. If they accept, God's time. Good. I'm not worried. In his time. I didn't ask for it. I didn't come to be a citizen. But 
God has moved things in such a way that now I've got three children here. My wife is here. The church that God gave is growing. I cannot run. But if God wants to move me, He will do it. I'm not afraid. You know, we must have a commitment to what God wants us to do. Not what people say. There are people in India who say, come over here. There are people in Philippines who say, come over here. There are people in Ethiopia who say, Pastor Kushi, come over here. And you, some say, get lost. Some say, please don't go. <laughs> of course, most say, stay. Most say, stay. Maybe one or two say, I don't want to see his face. That's fine. But nobody's going to change my appointment, wherever it be, because God has all decided. And I'm so glad to tell you, ah, I want to do his will in his time. Uh, we have a Filipino brother, Dennis Kabingi. <laughs> he was told when he applied for his uh, renewal of, I think it's called ESPAS. Is that called ESPAS? Okay. That unless his salary is substantially increased, they will not renew again. So now it's almost time for him to renew. I just sent out an email to our finance committee. Ask them to think. And I was having a short conversation with him the other day. You know, I don't sit with them and think, always discuss long. Sometimes when I come out of my room and they will be there, I say, hey, Dennis, how are things? Uh, is it not time for you to apply? Yes, pastor. I said, oh, it's going to be tough, you know, this time. Because he's the one who told me that it's going to be tough. So I said, well, how? We will apply. If they reject, are you prepared to go back to... The Philippines? He said, yes. So I said, brother, it's not that I don't want to increase your salary. But they are asking for 5000 and none of us have $5,000. And I'm not going to pay Dennis that money. Not because, I mean, I mean, <laughs> our church shouldn't be paying so high. Because we can support two other missionaries, isn't it? And none of us have paid that much. I said to him, you know, Pastor, oh, sorry, Dennis, if it is 500 more, maybe we can try and pull our resources to truth. But it's, 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 it's so many, much more, 3,000 more dollars or 2,005 more. That's a lot of money. So that's right, Pastor, that's not right. It is not right for the church to pay me so much. It's not right. We have certain principles. We sacrificially serve God. So I cannot expect, and I'm not expecting, I'm ready to go. I said, praise God. You know, now you know, on, the, on the Manpower MOM website, you can actually go in and test, put in all your details and see whether you have a chance to get. I don't know what they call it. So he went in and tried. With the present salary, no chance. The, then, of course, you, you, you put 5,000, sure got a chance, you, you can try. Uh, but when he put $500, because he heard, it's not 500 you know. So he thought, why don't give a try? And he was so delighted, he came back and said, Pastor, there's a chance. So what do I do? I got a clue. I immediately pick up my email, open the email, and I send a letter to e all the finance committee. Why don't we try? He is here, he's being used. Let's offer him another $500. Would you agree? I don't know whether the committee agree or not. I'm telling this in open. Because these are the burdens I bear sometimes as a pastor of this church. I don't tell you all the problems I go through. All these things weigh down on my heart very heavily. I love him. I love his family. I, I thank God for whatever they have done here. I want them to be around. God willing. God willing. Only if God willing. If it is God's will, if we go to Manila, I want to take care of him. God willing, our church must take care of him. But how to decide, how to go about, I was clueless, let me tell you. Until out of my mouth comes the word $500. And I was talking about impossibility. But he thought it could be a good try. And there, I was not offering him anything. I was just saying they won't accept $500. But whether it will be accepted at the end also, I do not know. But at least now I know I can try something if the session agrees. You know, what, why did I tell you this? 
Life can be so complicated. When all things are impossible around us, we know not how to go about, but something somewhere by the providence of God opens up. Boom. You know, the people are murderers. Jesus must hide. And yet, God sent a crowd. They surround him and he ministered to them. God has his way of doing things. Even in the midst of hostility. Did you see that? It's right there. How wonderful. All that we need to know is this. Like Jesus, the beloved servant of Christ, we must always be committed to the divine plan. To God's will. The timing he will help us to fulfill. The question is then, how committed are you to the divine plan? Like Jesus let us say, my meat is to do my Father's will. That's what Jesus said. To me, the greatest food is the will of God. My real appetite, the appetite of my soul, the craving of my being is to know and do his will. That's what a servant is. Time wouldn't permit to, to take you through all this passage. We will come back and study more. But remember these two things. The beloved servant Jesus Christ was hated by false servants. But that did not change his mind. He remained focused on the Father's will. The timing. The fulfillment. All just worked out neatly for the salvation of his people. May we rise up and yield ourselves to him.